Hi, everyone. So recently on Outrage and Optimism, listeners will be aware that we have been bringing you a series of conversations to break down what happened at COP26 from different angles. We've talked to activists, we've talked to politicians and a range of others. And today we wanted to bring you a perspective from somebody who is deeply immersed in the world of finance to comment not only on where this issue is writ large in the world right now, but specifically what came out of the COP. And we could not have anyone better than Hiro Mizuno. Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, appointed Hiro Mizuno as Special Envoy on Innovative Finance and Sustainable Investments in December 2020. He has been in this world for an enormous amount of time. He used to be Executive Management Director and Chief Investment Officer of the Government Pension Investment Fund of Japan, which is one of the largest asset owners in the world. I'm going to pass you over now to Christiana. Christiana and Paul hosted this conversation with Hiro just a couple of days ago. She further introduces him right at the beginning of the conversation, so I will leave you in her capable hands. But just to say that we will be back as ever this week on Thursday with a conversation with Jennifer Morgan, Executive Director of Greenpeace International. But for now, please enjoy this special conversation with Hiro Mizuno. Hiro Mizuno, thank you so much for joining us here on Outrage and Optimism. Uh, For those who don't know you yet, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres named you Special Envoy on Innovative Finance and Sustainable Investments at the end of last year, with the role to support the Secretary General's advocacy and engagement to encourage uh, private investments and public shifting of capital towards an area that is larger than climate change, towards the broader 2030 agenda and all of the sustainable development goals. So thank you for the work that you've been doing on that broader agenda for the past year. But if you don't mind, we wanted to focus this conversation on the support that you have been giving not only to the Secretary General, but to the whole process of shifting finance toward climate uh, goals. So if you don't mind, that's what we would like to um, focus on. And to start, here we are uh, coming out just a few weeks after COP26. My sense, Hero, but I would love to hear from your perspective, My sense is that if there was a sector who all of a sudden had a huge awakening about the risks of misinvesting into high carbon assets and the need to shift over to lower or no carbon assets, it was the financial sector. I have never seen as a dramatic a shift as the financial sector, and in fact, I would say announcement after announcement, commitment after commitment over the past 12 months, but then, of course, culminating in COP26. Is that your impression also that there was what I would almost call a sudden wake-up in the financial sector and then culminated um, at COP26? And if that is your observation, why do you think they all of a sudden woke up? Sure, Christiana, thanks for having me. It's my honor to work with you at the, uh, the COP26 and, uh, you know, the joining this, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the podcast session. Um, I'm really, you know, the, uh, encouraged and always inspired by your leadership uh, on the climate agenda. So thanks again for having me. So let me try to answer your question from my perspective, because I grew up in this industry for decades, and uh, before I, you know, the uh, uh, accepted the, uh, you know, the uh, Secretary General appointment, I used to run the uh, the Japanese Government Pension Investment Fund, which was the uh, the you know the the largest pension fund in the world with 1.5 or 7 trillion dollars, and then uh, throughout my time there. Uh, I Which always, is when I met you, Hiro. I visited you in your office when you were in that role. That's when we first met. So I remember that uh, absolutely, clearly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then when I, you know, the, um, the joined the GPF as an investment chief in 2015, uh, it already, you know, the uh, sort of like, uh, you know, the uh, discussion about the ESG because the, uh, uh, you know, the PRI, Principal Responsible Investment, was established by Kofi Annan several years ago. Uh, and then people started talking about ESG. But 
just to share, you know, the, my experience, I mean, uh, during the first two years of my ESG advocacy as the investment chief of the government pension fund, quite often I was called as a sort of a religious leader uh, or environmental activist uh, instead of like, a, you know, the financial professional who cares about the sustainability of the whole capital market. So uh, it's not the, all the sudden happened, but the, uh, you know, from my perspective, over the last five or six years, there's a sort of gradual shift in, uh, you know, the in the financial professionals' perception on uh, environmental issues, particularly in the climate. And uh, first, it started almost sounds like a, you know the uh, is an environmental activism or like a social responsibility uh, debate, uh, you know, across the financial sector. But the, throughout the time, there are two things became more uh you know the uh, more clear and uh, more widely accepted within the industry one is a climate change is really causing a uh, systemic risk to our financial system and uh you know that my peer special envoy mark Carney <clears throat> started as the the, uh, the governor of the bank of england calling it the uh, systemic risk but the uh, it took us a lot, you know several years to really digest what it means uh so the risk you know, the um, the aspects of the climate change in terms of the financial system or uh, more specifically, the uh, carbon heavy industry, or carbon heavy infrastructure uh, became well understood. So there are two things like exactly the same as like, you know, when the iPhone was introduced in 2007, it's not only because Steve Jobs came up with that idea, but the other uh, all the chips and the system was available to make it happen. So uh I, I always I think that is the same thing happens here because the, uh, the five years of a gradual change in a shift in the you know the mindset of the financial professional and the IPBC reports came to to our attention that the, we really need to take an action right now and the possible damage caused by the uh, the uh, scenario uh, you know we don't want it to see uh, is going to uh, really impact uh, you know the financial portfolio. So those things came uh, together this year, and also at the same times. You know, the, uh, that we have been talking about that we need the disclosure, we need the tools and those kind of things. And uh, some of them started blooming. So, uh, I think it just not really happened all of a sudden. It just kind of like we are creating a momentum. And, uh, this year, all, you know, all of the, you know, the factors came into the place so that the, uh, you know, the financial leadership was feeling comfortable uh, to commit such a, you know, the, uh, to such a broad, uh, you know, the, um, the bold and ambitious goals. No, that's a very good point that it didn't happen all of a sudden. I guess from my perspective, and I'm outside of your, of your sector hero, but from my perspective, what actually happened this year is that we got to critical mass. So I would definitely agree with you that uh, for, for years, in fact, ever since I was with you in your office, you and a few others have been shining lights on how do we shift finance over to ESG, environment, social and governance issues. But it did seem to me that in the past it has been a few shining lights, brightly shining lights. But this year we got to critical mass. Mm. And, and that is very exciting. And as you say, the, you know, all of the, the, the parts that needed to go in, uh, to this shift were, were now available. Um, and the critical mass that we saw at COP26, I would say, is embedded into this G fans, which is, a, 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 I don't know, Mark Carney loves the acronym. I'm not sure that I'm in love with it yet, but is the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. And it is 45 uh, institutions. 450 institutions. But, thank you. 450 <laughs> yes. in 45 countries. Yes. 450 institutions in 45 countries that together manage $130 trillion. And that under this GFANS umbrella, it brings together alliances that had already evolved, but now are coming together into this commitment to shift their portfolios to net zero by 2050. Really a pretty astonishing critical mass um, that has now come on board. Now, here's the question, Hero, because 
We all know that the financing of this shift in technologies, in, um, in, in the way we, in fact, even structure our financial system has to occur most urgently in developing countries. A, because that's where emissions in the future are going to come from. B, because they need more support than uh, those who operate in the space of the industrialized countries. And I have it, but please correct me if I'm wrong, that only 10% of those $130 trillion are actually allocated to developing mm-hmm. countries or to investment opportunities in developing countries. So that stands as one reality in one bucket, and it obeys many different very good reasons. But in the other bucket stands the reality that the UN estimates that what we actually need for the transition in those developing countries is more like Mm two-thirds of the total of $150 trillion that is needed for the transition. So how do we bridge that huge gap? between? How do we uh, bring down the risk of investments into opportunities that are emerging in developing countries? Sure. Let me stick back the, uh, the, you know, the put my perspective on the, uh, the G funds or Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. Now it's called the Global Financial Alliance for Net Zero after, pre- uh, after COP. Aha. One of the biggest achievement of that is due to that critical mass, uh, the people in the financial uh, sector or the people acting in the capital market or financial market now feels that but this is a consensus, that this is a base case scenario for them to analyze their investment or financing opportunities. So uh, just uh, like a 10, 12 months ago, if I talk to the, uh, the any financial sector analyst or like a people working in the, in a capital market, what what do you use as a your base case scenario and how you you know the compare your opportunity or risk uh, against those scenario? I always have said like you know the 80 90 percent of analysts said like oh well we still don't believe in a 2.0 degree scenario. So now I think the uh, the G funds is announcing like you know we are going to use 1.5 degree you know transition or like a pathway as our base case scenario. So uh, that's makes Wait, a Hiro, big difference. Wait, Hiro, can you say that once again? Sorry, can you say that? Because you've just said something that is hugely important. Are you saying that these 450 institutions managing $130 trillion have actually formally committed to a ceiling, to their financial transactions contributing to a ceiling of 1.5 versus 2 degrees? Did you just say that? Yeah, because the net zero requires 1.5 degree, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the goal, right? So uh, I think the, uh, the, when they say we commit to net zero by 2050, that means like uh, they are committing to 1.5 degree scenario. But the, uh, the reason why I think that kind of consensus is very critical is just two years ago, I gathered with the, uh, you know, the global, you know, the uh, CEOs and global financial uh, sector leaders. And um, I asked them a question after two days of discussion on how we can integrate ESG or climate change in the, uh, our businesses. And then I asked first that the, uh, do you believe we need to achieve 1.5 degree? And everybody said yes. Wow. And then I followed up with the question like, you know, do you think we are capable of achieving it? And, you know, unanimously answer was yes. Wow. And then I wow, followed up with hero. my last question, which is, which is, do you think it's going to happen? And uh, very few hands raised. Interesting. <laughs> so that means they knew we need to make it happen and we are capable of doing it, but we don't believe that's going to happen, right? So we just need to change that perception. Yeah, yeah. So what is the gap there? The gap there is like basically people think they can they can achieve it, but they don't think the other people try to achieve it. So it's just mm. about like a, I call it the vacuum of responsibility, right? So uh, now I think the other if that critical mass of the financial leadership says we are committed to make the uh, business aligned with 1.5 degree scenario, I'm hoping that the uh, the people working in financial industry now believe, oh, okay, 
Now that's going to be the base case scenario for us to use for our daily financial analysis and financial decision making. So that's for me the biggest achievement of G funds. But on the other hand, you know, the $130 trillion sounds like, a, you know, the very big number. And uh, we always need that kind of like, you know, the catchy headline. And, uh, you know, that sometimes people think like, uh, you know, the Marconi said the $130 trillion is available for climate finance which is a little bit overstatement because the just, just to aggregate, you know, the asset under management by those financial institutions sign up to G funds and how much of them is actually ready to uh, accelerate the uh, transition to sustainable energy society, energy economy. It's not very clear. So uh, we just need to make sure that the, uh, the, we totally align the portfolio with the net zero scenario at the same time, we need to invest more in the acceleration of a transition. So we need to put, take the money out of the, uh, the carbon heavy mm. industry if they don't show their uh, will to you know, the, uh, transform their business model and uh, put the money behind the people who bring in innovation or to push the uh, transformation much you know, the, uh, quicker. So, uh, but the, uh, you know, the inconvenient truth of that is we need to take the money out of somewhere to put that in the, uh, the area we need. So uh, that's the challenge, which yes. hasn't been addressed yet. Right. And uh, last but not the least is exactly the point you, uh, you know, the pointed out. Two thirds of that money have to go into developing countries and uh, there is no scheme enables that at the moment. So for example, let me tell you something like, you know, uh, asset manager, whatever they say about the net zero commitment, they cannot put the money in the emerging market unless their clients allow them to do it. And on the top of that, you know, the most of the asset manager uses uh, index like SP500 or like a FTSE and MSCI, those kind of things to evaluate their own performance. So unless those index has two third in the emerging market, they cannot shift the money into emerging market. So uh, there are a lot of things like credit rating agencies and other things like, you know, most of the other countries who need the, uh, the money for uh, transition, they are not even rated. They are like a treasury stock, treasury bond. So uh, we just need to work more closely. And the G funds is still the other uh, sort of like a, Alliance of the uh, those silos, they are trying to solve their own problem, but there's so much interdependence in the financial system. So uh, we start more intersectorial conversation within the financial industry, uh, financial market, and without that, I mean, we really cannot shift the the market into that direction. And uh, to put the more money in the emerging market, uh, we talk a lot about the how to create a green project. And how to create the uh, you know the uh, the pathway to those like a particular sector in the developing countries. But my argument is, you know, we have a, we made a lot of effort, you know, working together with MDB or like a multi development bank or development agency to create the last one mile of the uh, financial, uh, you know, the uh, the investment into those uh, green or uh, sustainable infrastructure, for example. But we haven't come up with the, our solution how to open the faucet to flow the water or the capital into mm -hmm. the, that destination. So uh, I think there's still a mismatch. And uh, I hope that the uh, Global Financial Alliance can really tackle that. But uh, it's more systemic the issue we need to address. Uh, at the same time, we definitely need to think about what kind of the, the, the you know, sort of last one, one mile financing scheme we can come up with. But it requires a lot of more creative thinking and a lot of more sort of candid conversation because it sounds sometimes hypo hypocritic or one financial actor talking about what they can do without, you know, the asking the other, you know, the, uh, the uh, actor or actresses in a financial market to change their, you know, the uh, uh, way of business. So, so here, can I ask a, 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 on a slightly technical question? You talked about this credit rating, and clearly, it's important that markets that don't have very good credit rating information get that. And that's something that I, you know, we have to hope the market comes forward with. But very specifically, we have, you know, many, 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 many thousands of listeners, 
And um, many of them work in financial institutions that are involved in GFANS, but also many of them work in NGOs that are trying to raise awareness of the public regarding green investment opportunities or low carbon investment opportunities. So I'm just checking if I understand you correctly. You're saying that it's actually now to, to fill this responsibility vacuum, which is a wonderful phrase, right? To fill that, we actually need employees of all the financial institutions around the world to start to use the authority of the GFAN's commitment to change investment behavior. And we need the public, people in pension funds, to talk to their pension funds or their investment managers about how they want to have these products. Is, is, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think like, you know, that we just need to talk to each other. I mean, they just, you know, none of the financial uh, the players, even the, the biggest asset manager or biggest pension fund, they cannot solve this problem by themselves. But they have been kind of like, uh, you know, the shy or hesitant to ask the other people to change their, you know, fine practice so that they to enable them to, you know, do what they are trying to achieve. So uh, I think the other uh, NGO is another thing. Like an uh, NGO, if they raise awareness of the other uh, customer base, because the other uh, financial institution has the other uh, institutional as well as retail customers. And if the NGO raise awareness among the uh, retail investors or retail customer of the bank, Banks feel like, well, they need to change their, you know, the business uh, practice. But that's something we need because the, the each party, whether it's a finance, really a financial player or like an NGO or, or the government, they need to step up to actually make the statement they commit. But to achieve what they are trying to achieve, they need the other people to do something differently from the, uh, the what they are doing right now. So... Uh, I think that kind of candid conversation is very important and the NGO can be a trigger of that kind of conversation because they can actually raise awareness among the other, you know, the investors. You know, I used to run the biggest fund in the world, but I always tell the other people who are just making their own personal investment, talk to your banker or talk to your broker right. and ask them like, you know, how can I make a more sustainable investment? How I can avoid, you know, the uh, the investing in the, the business who actually slow down the transition, and uh, that kind of a conversation, if it happens everywhere, I think the people, you know, the system starts moving. Uh, but at this point of time, that kind of intersectorial or like uh, you know the between different uh, you know actors conversation has been really you know missing. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, if I understand what you're saying, Hiro, is you're saying. Under GFANS, what we have is a vast collection of silos. Uh, and these are all of these separate institutions, all of which belong to different subsectors in the financial sector at large. But they're all still operating in their own silos. And the next step that we need is for all of them to understand that they're all heading in the same direction, yeah. net zero by 2050, and that the only way that they're going to achieve that is actually by stepping out of their silos and beginning to communicate very directly with each other for the pieces of the puzzle that each of them have to put on the table. Yeah. Now, if that is what you're saying, I am actually quite concerned, Hero, because that's going to take time. They're not used to operating like that, right? Yeah. That is a very different, that's innovative thinking and innovative acting, let alone innovative finance. And so that makes me very concerned because as we came out of COP, I think uh, one thing that was evident to everyone is that while there was jubilation and celebration of those inside who were the government uh, delegates, outside there is still a crisis of public trust. Mm -hmm. And we had, you know, speech from young people that said, Vanessa Nakate, for example, said, quite directly to the financial sector, she said, we don't believe that banks will suddenly put trillions of dollars on the table for climate action. Mm. When rich countries have struggled since 2009 to raise $100 billion for the world's most vulnerable countries, we don't believe that promises made by financial companies to end deforestation will actually prevent trees from being cut down. We simply don't believe it. And then she ended up by saying, I'm here to say, prove us wrong and God help us all 
if you fail to prove us wrong. So given that sentiment, and I think she expressed a pretty general sentiment uh, of everyone that was in the context, right, uh, and in the surround sound area of the cup. Given that sentiment, how does the financial sector that has this huge challenge that you have so well described of stepping out of their silos and working with each other in ways that they haven't done before, how do they do that? And how do they do that quickly enough to be able to harness public trust? I perfectly, you know, the uh, sympathize and agree with Vanessa's the comment, like, you know, they shouldn't trust it. I'm not, I'm not yet <laughs> because the, uh, the, you know, I always say like, you know, during the, the uh, Glasgow COP26, you know, I saw the actually frustration among the uh, financial sector leaders and some like, uh, you know, the political leaders about, you know, the um, their efforts has not been appreciated by those like a younger generation or, pro- you know, the Protestants on the street. But I always told them, like, I feel more sympathetic to those people because what we are saying is we have been we have been unfaithful to you guys for the last 10 years. And I promise now I'm going to be faithful by the end of, you know, next 30 years. That's what we are saying. So, of course, they shouldn't believe. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, of course, they shouldn't believe, right? So, uh, exactly. I think the, uh, <clears throat> but the one thing uh, I see the silver lining in the G funds is, you know, financial institutions, financial players by nature, very competitive. And they have, uh, you know, the uh, uh, tendency to try to move before the, everybody else moves because that's the way they prove they are worthwhile. Uh, they, you know, they're creating more return for their clients. So it's a bit of a, like a, you know, prisoner's dilemma because the, uh, the, when, you know, the, the bank now think like, you know, the, any project like a carbon, you know, the heavy project, not going to be insured by insurance company. They don't want to get close to that project, right? And when investor knows bank may not finance it, investor just want to run away as quickly as possible. Yeah. So uh, I, yeah. I think the one of the silver lining I saw in the sort of like glass, you know, G funds type of discussion is now people think we need to move faster than my co- my competitors. And uh, that kind of the uh, competitive, you know, competitive feeling actually drive the financial sector. So one thing I wanted to share with, and I want to say is, I think the other uh, sort of a competitive nature of the other uh, financial institution may now drive their, you know, transition to a net zero, you know, the uh, net zero business model, net zero portfolio. But on the other hand, like, you know, the how we can prove it, it's very hard. And uh, as I said, like, you know, the other, uh, you know, civil society, including those young people shouldn't, you know, the, uh, the keep their eyes off from the financial institution, whether they deliver. Uh, but I think the, uh, including the, you know, that we missed to agree on a carbon pricing, for example, but I also quite optimistic, like now, I think the private sector is now keen to develop the, uh, the carbon market, uh, not the uh, the carbon taxation, but the voluntarily, like, uh, you know, private, carbon pricing, carbon trading market. And uh, once any market is created, you know, the financial investors, like a financial professional's nature is they want to make money by arbitraging diff- across the uh, different the markets. So I think the uh, now I'm hopeful that the uh, it's sort of like a nat- you know, competitive nature or like, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the profit making uh, driver for the, uh, the financial uh, the players now actually accelerate the as the shift uh to the uh, sustainable uh you know the uh, sustainable development goals and uh it's too early for anybody to believe in what we said in uh, glasgow so uh i i think the, it's really up to us uh you know i think that christina you have been asked the same question but after the cop i have been asked so often that the uh, do you think the cop 26 was a success or failure and i keep telling i, I keep answering those questions saying like uh, we will prove whether it's a success or failure over the next 12 months. So uh, it's too too early for us to call it. Good answer. Yeah, too early for us to call it. Yeah, good answer. So our last question is is really, for me, is like, 
you know, I, I really think it's amazing what you said about how the competitive force, maybe people developing different products and different services to make differentiation between different uh, financial products is, is, is a very powerful force. That's super interesting. And, and, and maybe your comments will lead to more innovation. But um, uh, really on this point of, of carbon prices, and you know, you, I, I heard you've spoken before how uh, when financial institutions are looking at credit risk today, for example, they are already factoring in um, carbon as a factor. But, um, you know, to what degree do you think, uh, how, how best can financial institutions, for example, in GFANS, you know, lead the regulators and actually encourage regulators to make the, the kind of laws or tax or whatever that we need to, to, to reduce emissions as fast as we need to reduce them? That's actually another positive takeaway uh, from the, uh, the COP26 because I signed up to several the uh, letters, you know, including the B team. Uh, but the uh, this time, not only the uh, financial the uh, the sectors, but a lot of private sector urged the uh, the political leader to come up with a carbon pricing. So uh, if you look back uh, several years ago, when the uh, the government the political leader is trying to discuss the carbon pricing, they all hesitate to push it because they knew industrial sector would oppose that kind of ideas because that's going to be a cost mm -hmm. for them. But this time, you know, at the COP26, we saw so many private initiatives trying to urge uh, the, uh, the political leader to come up with the carbon pricing. Mm -hmm. So I told the, uh, the, my, you know, contact at the, uh, the, my own government, I said, you have no excuse, you know, the, about the not having a carbon pricing anymore <laughs> because you used to say like, oh, industrial leader wouldn't accept that. But now they are urging you to act. So uh, I think that's another, you know, the uh, positive takeaway from COP26 from my perspective. Um, so that, that's, that's my answer to that question. Thank you. Now is the time. Yeah, now is the time. I think the other, you know, the... Um, uh, responsibility to me as the uh, special envoy to promote innov innovation in finance to accelerate the transition to, or to achieve the sustainable development goals. I always feel a little bit embarrassed when I say innovative finance because, you know, I'm on the board of Tesla and I'm, I've been investor in the other uh, technology over, you know, the decades. And uh, I, I know exactly what the really innovation means. But when it comes to our own sector, like a financial industry, innovation is so little. So uh, I always feel a bit embarrassed because we always demand the portfolio company to be re innovative, to, 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 com to be competitive. But when you look at the, our own practice, uh, in the financial industry, we really lack innovation. Yeah, the, so, the, the question there is, where, where is the Tesla attitude in the financial sector, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's right. So we just need more innovation. We're just going to break the mold. Yeah, <laughs> but we need more innovation. So I think that during the COP26, there's a one uh, progress uh, I managed to contribute, which is the, uh, the uh, Prime Minister Kishida of Japan. They, he made you know announcement in his remark uh, that the uh, Japan is going to contribute additional $10 billion over the next five years to fill the gap of climate finance uh, for the uh, the most vulnerable company uh, countries. And then we are going to launch the innovative finance scheme to accelerate the uh, decarbonization in Asia, working together with the ADB and uh, other philanthropic foundation. So the, uh, the scheme is... We take the other uh, government guarantee to leverage the other uh, financing power of the developing, you know, the bank, in this case, the IDB, uh, and also blend that with not only blending uh, the other, uh, you know, the MDB's money and the public, you know, private money, but we are blending philanthropic capital into that to subsidize interest cost of the, uh, you know, the, for the borrowers. So we started seeing like a summer innovation uh, in, in that area or climate finance area. And we definitely need more innovation. I mean, uh, we, I always trying to call for more innovation in our industry because we have been too smart and uh, created the, uh, the financial system, which allow us to hold each other unaccountable. And that created a vacuum of responsibility. And it's very hard to crack. Uh, but the, uh, the, each of these like uh, new ideas I'm hoping to, you know, the uh, crack the uh, the this very complicated system financial industry and uh, bring the other uh, MDBs more, uh, you know, the uh, forward uh, in 
providing the uh, service of like a last one mile financing for the、uh, the people in the need for the mon- in need for money. Wow, Hiro. I mean, honestly, if if that can be addressed, the cost of capital has been so prohibitive for developing countries because for them, the cost of capital reflects not just that they're developing countries, but also that they're moving into technologies that they haven't、uh, deployed before. So it's almost like a double double whammy for for them, and that's why the cost of capital is so expensive. So if that can be addressed. Uh, that's a huge contribution toward making capital that is sitting there、um, accessible to developing countries. So, thank you、uh, for for that idea, and we certainly hope that that's one of the ones that will bloom over the next twelve months. But I wanted to ask you, sadly, our last question,、um, and bring you back to your、uh, statement that whether COP twenty six is a success or not will actually be defined over the next twelve months. So,、uh, as you look at that challenge, and you will be personally、uh, participating in order to increase the trust level over the next twelve months, are how you know what what are you outraged or concerned about as you see that challenge, and what are you truly, honestly, optimistic about? Well, I think the、uh, you know the basically、uh, humanity、uh, managed to. Uh, grow our economy and increase our, you know, the prosperity by promoting two systems. In my opinion, is one is capitalism and the second is democracy. And、uh, I think the see at, at this COP twenty six, I we started seeing that capitalism may be working or maybe now you know the ac- you know the works to accelerate the transition. We need a more, you know, the、uh, change and the、uh, the ambitions or like a step ups by the、uh, the、so、democratic side of our system. But the、uh, capital market, the、uh, the commitment, the capital market, you know, capitalism is now maybe working as an accelerator、uh, for the change. And I need to repeat that、uh, the the、uh, financial sector is the key industry. To enable the capitalism as a system to、uh, serve for everybody, so I think the I need to emphasize importance of the、uh, you know the financial industry to step up to play the role, maybe exactly the same role as they played during the industrial revolution, because they are they took huge risk during the industrial revolution and they accelerated change. I grew up in industry when we don't need to take too much risk. So、uh, now the time for the、uh, the financial professional to look back what we our predecessor did during the industri- industrial revolution to be on the acceleration side. Well, that's that that is quite a quite a statement, Hiro, and、um, I I really hope that you're right on that because yeah, I think it is the only way forward. And I must add that there are many out there who would be quite opposed to that idea because they're convinced. Given what we have seen from capitalism over the past few decades, they're quite convinced that capitalism is actually the problem, the root of the problem, and that it is completely incapable of contributing to the solution. So、um, I, I am very、yeah. hopeful that、um, capitalism, but in fact the financial sector. Will actually use the commitments that they have made now to、uh, to push us forward because I personally agree with you that、uh, many of the keys to solution are in their hands. So, Godspeed uh, and uh,、yeah. and thank you for explaining this to us. And we would love to talk to you, perhaps Hero, maybe six months down the road when when you have some.、Uh, Some view of what the runway is,、uh, and、uh, for you to give us an update as to what、uh, what our G fans friends have been doing. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for、uh, for taking the time, and especially thank you for、uh, for continuing to to kick there honestly and、uh, kick status quo. And、yeah. uh, and bring、uh, innovative thinking into a sector that is use as you say has not evolved very much in the past few decades. Thank you, Christiana. <laughs> it's, it's 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 really you know great to talk to you. Goodbye and thank you very much. Thank you. 